One low, two low, like the age of conversation. Hi, I'm Alessio Kikone, artist and author of the upcoming comic Blazer, and welcome to my channel. Now, as a way to help promote my comic, I thought it'd be fun and interesting to make a series of videos revolving around concepts found inside my book. One such concept is that of mythical creatures and monsters, uh, a very common concept in modern fantasy and fiction, but what most people aren't aware of is their more historical origins. Now, I have with me today a, a, a hunting book, actually, which has uh, small segments on one of these more common creatures. I'll read to you a small passage from this book. Uh, first, I'll read the summary and give you a little idea of what this is all about. And then after, uh, I think we'll have a much better understanding. This book is the oldest English book on hunting, The Master of Game by Edward of Norwich. This particular version was edited by William A. and F. N. Bailey Roman, with a foreword by uh, Theodore Roosevelt. I'll read you the back of the book. Master of Game is the oldest and most important work on the chase in the English language. Based primarily on Gascon de Foix's Livre de Chasse, originally composed in 1387, The Master of Game was written by Edward of Norwich at his leisure between 1406 and 1413, mostly while being held prisoner for having treasonous designs against his cousin, Henry IV. While much of the book is almost an exact translation of de Foix, Edward added five chapters of his own to form the major source for our knowledge of the medieval hunt. The book begins with a description of the nature of popular quarry such as the hare, deer, and badger, including their behavior, characteristics, and even smells, and then moves to a discussion of various hunting dog breeds and how to train them. The medieval chase was a ritual event, so the book continues with an explanation of various rules and techniques for a successful hunt including how food was to be distributed amongst the hunters, the support persons, and the dogs. Weapons and traps of choice are also described, as well as the different horn calls used for communication. The Master of Game is a unique text for naturalists, hunters, and persons of interest in social history. Although hunting is nowadays far removed from most people's experience, it was of major interest in the time of Edward Gnorick for ritual sports and of course, food. Some knowledge of the chase was essential for all persons of medieval times. This edition, the first ever paperback of the original version edited in 1909, includes a hearty foreword by Theodore Roosevelt, who adds some important contextual information about the chase and draws on his own vast hunting experience. I'd like to read, even for those who are not keen on the sport, the Master of Game has, as one review exclaimed, all Chaucer's freshness, love of the open sky and fragrant woodland. Now at the bottom, there's a brief uh, explanation of the persons involved in the making of the book. Edward of Norwich, second Duke of York, born somewhere around 1373 and died 1415, was cousin of King Richard II and became a supporter of the House of Lancaster in 1399, he was killed at the Battle of Agincourt. William A. Bailey Grumman was an outdoor writer, adventurer, and explorer who spent much of his life developing business interests in British Columbia, Canada. Florence Nicholas Bailey Grumman was often his collaborator. Theodore Roosevelt, 1858-1919, the 26th President of the United States, was an avid door outdoorsman he wrote extensively about the wilderness and big game hunting. All right, so now that we know where this is coming from, I'll read you a quick excerpt from this book. Now, let me just find where my passage is. Here we go. They live on all manner of flesh and on all carrion and of all kinds of vermin and live not long, for they live not more than 13 or 14 years. Their biting is evil and venomous on account of the toads and other vermin that they eat. They go so fast when they be void, 
are empty. The men have let run four leashes of greyhounds, one after the other, and they could not overtake him, for he runs as fast as any beast in the world, and he lasts long running, for he has a long breath. When he is long hunted with running hounds, he fleeth but little from them, but if the greyhounds or other hounds press him, he fleeth all the covert, as a boar does, and commonly he runs by the highways. And commonly he goeth to get his livelihood by night, but sometimes by day, when he is sour or hungered. And there be some wolves that hunt at the hart, at the wild boar, and at the roebuck, and windeth as far as a mastiff, and taketh hounds when they can. There are some that eat children and men, and eat no other flesh from the time that they are bloodied by men's flesh. For they rather be dead. They are called werewolves, for men should be wary of them, and they be so cautious that when they assail a man, they have a holding upon him before the man could see them. And yet, if men see them, they will come upon them so cunningly that with great difficulty a man will escape being taken and slain, for they can wonder well keep from any weapon that a man beareth. There are two principal causes why they attack men. One is when they are old and lose their teeth and their strength and cannot carry their prey as they were wont to do. Then they mostly go for children, which are not difficult to take, for they do not carry them about, but only eat them. And the child's flesh is more tender than is the skin or flesh of a beast. The other reason is that when they are have been bloodied excuse me, in a country of war where battle have been they eat dead men or if men have been hanged or have been hanged so low that they may reach there too or when they fall from the gallows and man's flesh is so savory and so pleasant that when they have taken to man's flesh they will ever eat the flesh of other beasts never excuse me eat the flesh of other beasts, though they should die of hunger. For many men have seen them leave the sheep they have taken and eat the shepherd. It is a wonderfully wily and cunning beast, and more false than any other beast, to take all advantage, for he will never fly but a little, save when he has need, for he will always abide in his strength, stronghold and he hath good breath for every day it is needful of him for every man that seeth him chaseth him and crieth after him so uh that was uh part of the chapter the wolf and his nature there are something like um i believe 20 chapters in this book 26 no 36, whoops, my uh, Roman numerals aren't the best offhand, yeah, XXXV1, I believe that's 30, 36, very interesting book, the majority of the book, as I've read to you in the back, is mainly about hunting animals, even this part is about hunting animals, but uh, it's interesting that at least in uh, 13, hundreds, fourteen hundreds era Britain and France, the werewolf was viewed as an animal that has become, I guess you could say evil. Uh, it's become fascinated or tempted, seduced, if you will, by uh, men's blood. So I hope you enjoyed that, and I plan on doing more videos like this. If you did, leave a like, comment. Comment's more interesting than a like, to be honest. And uh, yeah, feel free to check out what else I got. Have a good day.